Excellent. Okay. So I acknowledge my co-presenter, Dr. Alexandra Fyodorova. Okay. And the lesions that I will be reviewing are osteoblastoma, tenosynovial giant cell tumor, synovial chondromatosis, tophaceous pseudogout, tophaceous gout, and oxalosis. So for the first lesion, osteoblastoma, we see it's a lesion we're all familiar with and has a predominance uh, in the jaw, cervical spine, uh, thoracic and lumbar spine, as well as in the feet with an age predilection of 15 to 45. The World Health Organization classifies this lesion as locally aggressive with nidus larger than 1.5 centimeters, differentiating it from an osteoidosteoma. There's less or little uh, less or no reactive sclerosis compared to osteoid osteoma. 50% have a radiodense matrix elements on radiographs, and it should be differentiated from osteoid osteoma, aneurysmal bone cyst, and osteosarcoma. Atypical cells on pathology occur in atypical or pseudosarcomatous osteoblastoma, and the genetic markers that we use are FOS and FOSB gene rearrangements. The first case that I show is uh, courtesy of uh, Professor Leonard Kahn. It's a 20-year-old white female with a swelling of the left temporal mandibular joint of nine months duration. And here we see that on the uh, left, there is a uh, lesion destroying the um, uh, neck of the mandible with an expansile lesion that has uh, radiodense uh, bony elements within it, high attenuation that we see on CT. And on the pathology, we see uh, classic mature bone formation with extensive osteoblast formation without any evidence of uh, malignancy. And this is classic pathology for an osteoblastoma. And the bone club diagnosis for this case is osteoblastoma. The second lesion I discuss is a tenosynovial giant cell tumor, which is the World Health Organization classification of this. They can be intraarticular or extraarticular, and for the intraarticular variant, these used to be called pigmented villonodular synovitis, with an uh, uh, age predilection of 25 to 45, and it occurs predominantly in the hands, hip, the knee is the most common site in the ankle, but really it, it can affect any joint and can affect the cervical spine and lumbar spine and cause uh, spinal stenosis, nerve obstructions. Tenosynovial giant cell tumor, when it's intraarticular, can be localized or diffuse forms. The localized form is a nodular form. The etiology is unknown, and uncertainty still exists regarding the neoplastic or inflammatory nature of this lesion. The diffuse form is um, very difficult to treat, and when it's extensive, can require very aggressive treatment. MR characteristics of this lesion are dark signal on all sequences that are caused by hemosiderin deposition. Colony stimulating factor 1 receptor, CSF1R, is expressed in mononuclear and giant cells, but these are the minority of cells that are less than 20% of the cell population in tenosynovial giant cell tumor. With the localized type, which is the most common type, resection is curative. The diffuse type, which is much more difficult, may require amputation when extensive and involves neurovascular bundles. Unfortunately, we have uh, extensive experience with this diffuse type. Mononuclear histiocytes can be seen on pathology with FOMO, foamy histiocytes that may be in clusters. This case is, uh, again, courtesy of Professor Leonard Kahn, a 47-year-old woman clinically thought to have a meningioma at the temporal lobe. And here we see on coronal MRI an extraaxial lesion that is uh, pushing the uh, temporal lobe of the brain uh, superiorly. It's an extrinsic mass, and it appears to... Uh, it appears to be a uh, mass growing out of the skull. Uh, adjacent to this uh, lesion, inferiorly, we do see the temporomandibular joint region, 
But initially on MRI, the, uh, this as a uh, temporomandibular joint as a source of the lesion was not considered, which is actually common when um, tenosynovial giant cell tumor extends out of articulations and invades surrounding uh, areas. The pathology is classic for tenosynovial giant cell tumor. And on the bottom right, you can see the uh, g- scattered giant cell tumors, s- scattered giant cells. And the bone club diagnosis is tenosynovial giant cell tumor that arose from the temporomandibular joint and invaded the skull. Synovial chondromatosis, classic age of 45 to 65, and uh, we know it uh, to involve pretty much any joint, including the spine, but most commonly in the hip, knee, and elbow. It's a disorder of synovial metaplasia and classified by the World Health Organization as an intermediate-grade lesion due to a high recurrence rate. The stages of the disease are active early, active synovial disease without intraarticular bodies, transitional active synovial disease with intraarticular bodies and late intraarticular bodies, but no synovial disease. Fibroblastic growth factor nine was identified at the periphery of nodules and only five to 10% of uh, chondroid nodules ossified. Gene S mutation can be seen. There's an FN1 ACVR2A and ACVR2A FN1 rearrangements infusions that can be de- detected in fish and can be found in both benign and malignant forms. IDH1 and IDH2 are not found, and rarely these cases may present de novo as malignancy. And uh, the first case is a 29-year-old male with right hearing loss and a mass filling the external auditory canal without tinnitus, vertigo, or disequilibrium. Audiogram demonstrates conductive hearing loss. And here we see that there is bone destruction involving the um, involving the uh, temporal bone in the region of the adjacent to the middle ear. We see it extending to the external auditory canal, and it is next to the temporomandibular joint. On coronal MRI, we see the mass within the region of the middle ear adjacent to the temporomandibular joint, but it's not clear to see a connection to the temporomandibular joint. On the sagittal view, we do see the mass extending from the temporomandibular joint posteriorly into the temporal lobe. And on pathology, we see some fibrous tissue, but we see classic cartilaginous formation. And here at the bottom right, you see the classic nests of cartilage in, uh, in little groups that are so typical of synovial chondromatosis. And this is synovial chondromatosis of the temporomandibular joint invading the skull. Tophaceous pseudogout uh, is a form of pyrophosphate arthropathy, ages of involvement most classically 45 to 65, and it is pyrophosphate dihydrate depositions. The mass can, masses can be large, they can form in facet joints, they can be neurological, uh, neurologically significant, and they can cause uh, cloud-like formation on CT. Um, and here we see... Um, Tophaceous uh, pseudogout can include chondrocalcinosis and pyrophosphate arthropathy. The pseudogout is really a clinical presentation. Metaplastic chondrocytes are sometimes present and can be confusing. People can confuse this with synovial chondromatosis. After uh, surgical resection, these can re- uh, recur, and we find weakly positively birefringent rhomboids on um, on polarizing light microscopy. And the patient is a 57-year-old male with a firm mass in the region of the temporomandibular joint for several months. This is the classic CT of tophaceous pseudogout. We see the cloud-like calcification at the left in the region of the temporomandibular joint. And on pathology, we see what looks like cartilage, but without the classic little nests of chondrocytes that we see in synovial chondromatosis. And on polarizing light microscopy, we see these areas of uh, both blue and gold due to compensating polarization of the weakly positively uh, birefringent rhomboids. So this Professor, is sufficient. Professor Hermati, about- excuse me, please. Professor Herm- Hermati, you're speaking too fast. It's not easy for our translators. If it's possible oh. to speak a little bit slowly, we have extra time for you. It's, it's, yes. It will be not a problem to be longer. Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you. So this is tophaceous pseudogout of the temporal mandibular joint. Tophaceous gout, uh, most commonly ages 35 to 65, involves the appendages, but again, can involve the spine and, uh, and in rare cases can cause spinal stenosis. The cause is sodium urate deposition. The tophi occur on average 12 years after the first gout attack. 
and 20 to 30 percent of TOFI calcify on x-ray. The majority are in men over age 50, and the percentage of involvement in women and younger ages are rising. This used to be considered a disease of the rich, but because of dietary and uh, cultural changes, it's now invo it involves all groups. We see strongly negatively by polymorphonucleic PMLs, polys, and spill proteolytic enzymes into the surrounding soft tissues. The patient is a 46-year-old female with a left temporal mandibular joint complaints for approximately five years with increasing malalignment of the temporal mandibular joint and trismus. A hard palpable mass is present, laterally displacing the superior parotid. And here we see these fluffy calcifications that are amorphous in the region of the temporal mandibular joint. Radiographically, in the temporal mandibular joint, we would normally consider pyrophosphate arthropathy more common than uh, gout. But on pathology, here we see with the degalanthus stain, we actually can see the shadows of the negatively birefringent needles of a gout attack. So this is tophaceous gout based upon a positive degalanthus stain. And the last uh, entity that I'll review is oxalosis. An autos autosomal recessive condition associated with hyperoxaluria and early onset renal failure. Hyperoxaluria causes rapid failure of renal transplants in patients that had renal transplants, such as the case I will show. Osseous oxalate crystal deposition at the metaphysis causes a foreign body reaction and metaphyseal lucencies, which are classic radiographic appearances, and a bone within bone appearance is often seen. The three most common gene mutations are AGXT, GRHPR, and HOGA1. PH1 and PH2 mutations cause reduction in oxalate formation. PH3 mutation triggers increased oxalate mutation. And vitamin B6, pyridoxin, is used as a treatment for oxalosis. This is a case courtesy of Dr. Syed Hoda. And here we see there's a, uh, this is a PET CT, and we see increased activity in the region of the skull base anterior to the temporal mandibular joint with a corresponding lytic lesion in the region anterior of the increased activity. But on PET scan, it does not appear uh, to arise from the temporal mandibular joint. The pathology in this case shows classic uh, star-shaped uh, patterns of oxalate crystals, different from all the other crystals that I've shown you. And uh, nothing else really looks like this. And once again, on your left is uh, the polarizing light microscopy pictures. So this is a, a classic presentation. And this is oxalosis secondary to end-stage renal failure. So the entities that I've reviewed were osteoblastoma, tenosynovial giant cell tumor, synovial chondromatosis, Tophaceous pseudogout, tophaceous gout, and oxalosis. Thank you very much.